check with her up. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. Good. <laughs> it's a lovely day. Well, not so nice weather-wise, um, but it's great to be here together with you and to be sharing with you some of our journey. Some of you will know us very well, and uh, we are certainly grateful and appreciative of uh, all the years that North Rocks has been supporting us in prayer and financially and friendship too has been wonderful. You, some of you might remember two of our boys were uh, with you in the youth group for a couple of years and uh, probably some of you do know us from before. Sorry we can't be there in person for you and um, it would be great just to sit and talk. And I want to say a happy Mother's Day to everybody, not only mothers, but uh, to all parents, because we all need lots of wisdom, understanding and discernment, and uh, that wisdom comes from God. And that's what I want to talk about today. As we go into the, um, the message this morning, I want to think about Daniel, a very familiar story. And as we think about Daniel, uh, we... Uh, Probably the story that comes to our mind is the story of the uh, Daniel in the lion's den. And maybe some of you know that chorus too, Dare to be a Daniel. So as we uh, go into a uh, message for today, I want to take a few steps back, several steps back, before the lion's den story, because we're reading in chapter one. And thank you, Barbara, for the reading. Thank you for the music. It was good to, to hear and to be a part of, of that. So what's enabled Daniel to be uh, to come to the point where he was uh, tested and he, he continued to pray three days despite what the king had decreed and for that he was thrown into the lion's den. So I want to look at chapter one in particular today and as we move on, we can get a glimpse of just what Daniel was all about. So, uh, first of all, we're uh, in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we are given the scene. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, arrives on the scene. It's very familiar a uh, very familiar passage and story to us all. But I want to explore some of the tests that uh, Daniel and his friends went through, and I want to apply those to our lives as well. So as, Dan as Nebuchadnezzar arrives on the scene in Jerusalem, he is faced with um, the besieging of Jerusalem, and during that time, he is able to desecrate the temple, the temple of God, their God, the Jews being the chosen people of God. And it must have been such a, a dismay and a despair to them as they, see Dan, as they see Nebuchadnezzar taking things out of their temple and removing them to the, um, his own treasure house back in Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar, in effect, was saying... My God is better than your God because I have defeated you. I've taken these things out of your temple. And so Daniel and his companions were also taken captive in the year 605 BC, taken off to Babylon. And they had to cope with the grief of all the loss that was involved in living in a foreign land. Even the name was changed to his Daniel's name and the names of the other three men were changed so that they'd lost their identity. They were no longer Jewish people with their own names. They had now become Babylonians with Babylonian names and names of Babylonian gods. Now in exile, their world had fallen apart. And uh, I remember back to um, many years ago when we hadn't been long in Misama just feeling like my world had fallen apart too and I'd lost my identity. Who was I? A loss of language and culture. And uh, people wanted to, wanted when I was speaking to people in the village because I didn't know the language, they, they wanted me to speak slowly and um, 
and they spoke, spoke slowly and loudly to me so that I felt like not even a child and I can feel that uh, probably Daniel would um, feel some of that. He's, uh, he's lost and he's at the mercy of his enemies. This is moving on. Yep, and so we pick it up here. Just he'd lost family. And I can remember too, sitting on a Mother's Day actually in church and tears came to my eyes because I didn't have my family around with me. Um, thinking of my son uh, who was going through particular trials at the time and not able to, to, um, to be with him and he wasn't able to be with me. So going back to Daniel, Daniel must have thought with his friends, he must have thought, well, where is our God? What's happened? Why isn't he here with us? How come he's defeated? It seems like he's defeated. How can they, how can they um, do this to us? Where is God in this whole situation? The world was falling apart for them. The temple was destroyed. Many of their leader types were now in exile and removed from the land. And so... Daniel and his friends too must have thought, well, how do I adapt in this foreign land? I'm helpless, I'm hopeless, what am I going to do? And while we didn't live amongst enemies when we went to the village um, in the early days in the 1970s and 80s, yet it was like we were in a foreign land and culture. And what were we to do? How were we to to adapt? One of the things I found hardest was to be able to give and receive to be asked for things as a white person and to feel like I was being taken advantage of. And yet I had to learn that giving and receiving, working with people being uh, the reciprocity of living in a village was the most important value and I needed to fit in. But as we look at Daniel, he also needed to, to fit in. But how was he to do that? And then comes the test. The test of, of whether he was going to eat and drink the food and the wine that was given to him from the, from the king's uh, temple, uh, the king's house. So this was a low time for Judah and God's people. The uh, temple was destroyed and here they were in this foreign land and thinking about, well, had God abandoned them? And Nebuchadnezzar's idea was total indoctrination. These captives have to assimilate to these values, to Babylonian values. And so for three years, the idea was that these young men who were chosen from the captives for their noble birth and for their particular abilities, their intelligence, these, three, these men, young men, were to have three years of training. So what was Daniel going to do? And we find that in verse 8 in particular, Daniel purposed in his heart, or another way of putting it, is that Daniel was determined or he determined not to defile himself. Well, we would think, was it really that important? It's only a matter of food and drink. Why did Daniel have to make a fuss? Why was this such a big test? Why was this such a trial for him? But as we think about it, he must have realised that his relationship with God touched every area of his life, including what he ate. And food, the food, from, food and wine from the king's table had probably been offered to idols. The food was probably contained meat that the Jewish people were not able to eat. And so for eating, eating that food and wine would have been in direct disobedience to God's word. But where was God? Was he with them? Daniel determined not to defile himself and he determined to trust in God. He and his friends had several choices. They could have rejected the whole idea and probably ended up dead together with the attendants and the officials that were in charge of them. They could have acceded 
and said, yes, we'll go along with the crowd. We'll do what everyone else does. He had several choices, but he chose to find a middle way. And God gave him wisdom so that he requested a trial, a trial for 10 days. This was a godly compromise that he worked on. And we find that as um, easy to, to think that God has let them down and abandoned them, but God was in fact working behind the scenes. If we look at some of the verses from chapter 1, we find that God gave victory. God gave victory to Nebuchadnezzar. It was God that was at work punishing the Judah people because of their idolatry and their sins against him. And it was Daniel and his friends who were chosen to be specially trained. And we find, too, that just in the short time that he'd been in the country in Babylon, that he had gained a good reputation and was in favour with the official that was supervising him. So God was at work through Daniel's character and through the other things that were happening around him, the circumstances and the situation. He was given wisdom by God in verse 12. If, if you're following along in your Bible, you can see that there. God gave him wisdom and special abilities as he gave to the other three men too. God affirmed their stand so that when they had the test of 10 days, they were living on vegetables and water, norm, not normally uh, producing well-nourished people, I don't think, especially after only 10 days. But in that short time, they proved God. They tested God, they trusted God, and they proved that he indeed came through for them. They were recognised for their abilities, the special abilities, and the king, in fact, made the declaration in verse 20 that uh, Daniel and his friends had ten times the amount of wisdom of all the other astrologers and sorcerers and witchcraft people and, that were in his kingdom and who, with whom he consulted. So we find, too, as we look at the last verse in this chapter, we wonder, well, why is it here? It kind of seems like it should be right at the end of the book, but it's at the end of this chapter because it shows us that powerless Daniel, Daniel who was brought as a captive to a foreign land, thinking God might have abandoned him, was faithful and tested God and found that he was true to his word and followed the pro uh, and came through with his promises. So we're thinking too, all right, what about us? Do we think like Daniel in times of difficulty? It was easy to think that God had let them down. But what were they to do? And they tested God in this small step of eating and drinking the right things, and they found that God came through. And God was working behind the scenes in order to work out his purpose and plan for the Babylonian people, for the Jewish people. In verse 21, as we saw, Daniel was actually in the country of Babylon and saw many kings come and go in that time and yet he was able to see God's promises fulfilled. 70 years later God sent the Jewish people back through working through a foreign king, Cyrus, were living in Babylon. So as we see the, uh, the influence that uh, Daniel and his friends had, God was working through hardship and suffering to place his people in positions of leadership in a foreign country, the country of Babylon. And we find that to the end, Nebuchadnezzar in several places, as I've uh, mentioned up here, uh, chapter 2 and verse 47 the king of Babylon said, Truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries. And again in chapter 3 and verse 29, he says, There is no other God who can rescue like this, talking about the fiery furnace. And I want to just uh, focus on this last, uh, the, these last verses of, in chapter 4. 
all the people on earth. This is what Nebuchadnezzar said. All the people on earth are nothing compared to him. He does, God does as he pleases, and no one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar uh, proclaimed and continued to um, to think about during his lifetime, even though at times he was not all that willing to follow God. But he made this proclamation throughout the land that everyone should worship the God of, of Daniel and his friends. So as we think about the time that Daniel had spent in Babylon, and we think of our own lives too, has there been a time in your life when you needed to take a stand? And I think back to uh, our times at Missima, and one of the very early times was uh, our son Jeffrey had an abscess, and it was he was about three years of age. He'd already started to walk well and truly, and um, he had an abscess unbeknown to us because we didn't have the medical uh, help that we needed in the village. And yet uh, our, our leader friend, Tonawak, who lived next door to us and was looking after us in the village, and we called him father. He came to Bill one day and he said, why don't you try the witch doctor? I'm sure that he would have the right remedy in the right spell. And sort of made us feel help. What do we say? We can't go with witch doctors. We want to pray to God and we want to and, and get medical attention to as much as we can. But what do we say to this gentle man who was making a suggestion and offering to help us in this way? And Bill needed much wisdom as he uh, answered Tonawak. And I think too, more recently of a time when I signed an, a petition, um, some of you will be familiar with Australian Christian Lobby, and the first time I actually signed a petition um, whether I'm not sure it was abortion or what it was at the time, but um, I thought I'm putting my name to an official document and that may be held against me in the future, just as Daniel felt like he was rejecting um, the king's decree and he had to find a middle way so that it wasn't just such a, an obvious no to the king. And the last ta- thing I want to just pull together from these verses that we've looked at together is, has there been a time in your life when God was working behind the scenes? I'm sure that as you think about difficult, challenging situations, times of suffering or pain, has God been working and how was he working? Can you can you look like Daniel was able to look at um, what he has had been doing to prepare the way and to make Daniel successful. And we can think of the recent time, Bill will tell us more about it in a moment, uh, when our two Missima translators came to Australia. We'd organised for them to, get, to come with uh, colleagues of ours and for them to accompany them on the plane, going through the, um, you will understand, the intimidation exigency of... Uh, quarantine and customs and security, because Missima people are fairly laid back and, and just a completely unfamiliar environment to came, and they were accompanied on the way here. They stayed for six weeks, and as they, they were going back again, we wondered, well, what's God going to do? Are they going to make it on their own back to their country? Or is he going to provide someone? We got to the airport in the morning in Brisbane Airport and uh, there was a Papua New Guinean guy sitting there. His name's Kevin. He looked at Jerry. Jerry's the one on the right. And he said, hey, don't I know you? We went to school about 30 or 40 years ago together. And it turned out that Kevin was a Bible college lecturer, a Christian, and he was only too pleased to go with these two translators of us and to help them through the whole of customs. So really um, glad for what God was doing and he was working behind the scenes. But think about a time when you also can acknowledge God working behind the scenes.
So, as most of you know, we've been working at Missima for many, many years now, and uh, they're on the map. You can see Missima. Um, and then in the last 10 years, we've also been working in a neighbouring language um, in the Saisa language area. And it's been a real privilege to be there um, in that area working and doing Bible translation. But I want to just encourage you, um, as we just look at a few slides, that even though you've never been to Misama, um, what the Bible translation work that's happening at Misama and in the Saisai area is actually part of the ministry of North Rocks Community Church. And um, so I want to encourage you to uh, keep praying and keep praying for the people, even though their culture is so different and their, their, um, their modes of transport are so different, yet uh, they need the same message that Sandra's just been telling us about, that God is in control and that they can trust him. So 25 years ago, the uh, Muslim and New Testament was dedicated. And this coming next Sunday, in a week's time, the Misama community, the Misama churches, uh, will be gathering together. Um, in uh, some, some places, they'll be joining together in large groups, some in individual churches, and they will be celebrating Bible Sunday. And part of that celebration um, will, will, will be especially because of the fact that it's 25 years now since the New Testament was done. But since then, we've, uh, we've done lots of things initially and other roles, but more recently we've been come back to do, back to the missional work and working in, the, in translation, working with a, local, a team of local translators, Misima translators. So they are the translators and we're working with them. Currently working in um, Isaiah and Psalms. Uh, most of that work is, uh, for me, most of that work is remotely, just uh, working on the computer here right in front of me now and uh, sending off uh, notes to the team which they get and, and work on. Uh, but from time to time, we've had people come down to Australia. So Jerry and Ayasi came down to Australia in March and uh, we were able to spend some time with them. They, uh, while they were here, they did um, some uh, sightseeing and got to understand a little bit more about uh, uh, Australian culture and a little bit more about uh, just gave them a bit of a wider view of things and I think that is also valuable for them in helping them in their, uh, in their Bible translation work. But we work together on Psalms and we've now, we're now 80% of the way through, uh, through the book of Psalms and so this is in uh, in our, here in, in Wallingbar in northern New South Wales, working together with them. We plan to have uh, Jerry uh, and uh, his sister, Fia Fia, who's the one in the forefront there in the picture, uh, come down again in a couple of months' time. And uh, we'll can work on Psalms again, finish Psalms, and then go on to other books um, with them. So pray for that and our time uh, with them. Uh, we have uh, the visas that we need already, the Australian visas already. Um, currently, we're trying to get their PNG passports renewed uh, because uh, the, uh, they are coming close to the end of their, the time when the passports expire. So just pray for all of that. And, Continue to pray that God will give us wisdom as we work together in translation. And so the people at Misama will be able to, uh, as they worship together, just like we today are worshipping together, they will have God's word, including the Psalms, um, 
for them to use and for them to read uh, together. So the, what's coming up immediately is that the end of the mainland there. We'll be going to Alatau at the end of this month. Um, the 1st of uh, June we'll arrive in Alatau and um, people will come, readers and the Misima translators will come from Misima and the Saisai areas by boat uh, to Alatau. And the reason, the main reason, the main purpose of our being there this time is to do recording work. So several books have been translated in the last uh, three or four years. And what we want to do is to record those books so that people can not only read them, but they can also listen to them. And so here is a picture of uh, the recording work in taking place uh, th in 2018, which was the last time we did this. And uh, so um, we will be recording for Misima, um, the One and Two Kings, and, um, and two other books. And for Sai Sai, we'll be doing John and Colossians, two Thessalonians and one Timothy. They'll be being recorded. Uh, so we will have help on the technical side uh, to do that. Um, and we'll be there for about five months in Alatau. One of the advantages of being in Alatau is that we'll be also able to uh, spend time with friends that we already know there who are uh, missing friends who live and work in Alatau. And also we have grandchildren in, in Alatau and looking forward to being able to spend some of that time with them as well. So um, now the purpose of all of, of this uh, is to put them onto phone apps. And so uh, all of the transition we do is put onto um, in Missima Bible app or SciSci Bible app. And that also includes the recorded scriptures. And also uh, people can listen to them, players. And so this is all part of making God's word available, not just translating it, but making sure that people have it in a way that's accessible to them and that they can read and that they can hear. And as we've said, you are part of this work. And so we want to thank you for that and pray that you and thank you and pray with us that God will continue to work at Misima. He is working just like he's working with Daniel and uh, pray for us and pray that God's kingdom will be established at Misima. So as we clap here uh, this morning, I'd like to remind us of a verse from Proverbs 31, which is all about mothers, uh, about women. And uh, it reminds too of the wisdom that we've been talking about that God gave to Daniel, and the wisdom that God gives to us too. And so I'd like to leave this verse with you, especially the mothers. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instruction with kindness. We saw that all coming out in the story of Daniel from chapter 1. But more than that, she's able to laugh without fear of the future. I'm not sure that I can say that. Um, and I'm not sure that my words are wise and I have instruction with kindness. I do want to be kind. Uh, but, yeah, this is something that as God continues to refine us and work in us, each of us, and as we trust him that he is, as the book of Daniel tells us, he's the one in control. He's working for our good. He wants us to trust him with whatever lies ahead and to honour him and put the relationship with him, we have with him first in our lives. And that reminds me of the, of the verse that I've been trying to work on and, 
and put it in my mind from day to day. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind because that is the basis of our relationship with him. So as we close here, we um, get to the last one. Here we go. And uh, Mizuma people also will be celebrating Mother's Day today. And the word of God is for them, uh, just as Bill said, and for us as well. And the word of God, as it's translated, shows us that who is holding the power? It's God. And to go into this week, may the uh, challenges and the tests come your way. Uh, may you be trusting God and put him first. Not easy to do, very difficult in all of our circumstances, but as we go through the week, he is the one working behind the scenes. He's the one in control. He's the one in charge. And we know that he is good. God is good all the time. May I leave that challenge with you and um, may you know his peace and joy, love, patience, kindness, and all the rest of the bits of the Spirit working in life as well as your trust in him being um, strengthened and as you see him working and giving the glory and praise. So we'll close here and I'll just pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that um, you've given us in your word stories of remarkable people, people who trusted you. We also have stories of people who, who failed in their trust in you. Thank you that you put all those people there because they represent us too. Thank you that you are the one working behind the scenes for the good of your people. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for being our peace and our comfort as we go into this next week. And I pray your blessing on North Rocks Community Church and all in it, all who work and serve and minister and, and attend. May you continue to pour out your blessing and make them a blessing also. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.